Can you hear me fine? Yes, can hear you fine. Okay. All right. Good. I've never used Webex, so <laughs> we'll see how I can do this. All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our tenth session. Uh, today, today's theme is strength and conditioning, and with us uh, we've got Clark Simmons uh, from based out of Delhi with Sporting Ethos. He's he's the expert who's going to take us through the importance of strength and conditioning for squash. Uh, also, just to tell uh, all of you all that Clark has been involved with squash players. Uh, he was also there for the camp which we had uh, uh, for our Asian junior team. So he is well aware of the demands required for squash and he works with squash players as well. So over to you, Clark. Thank you, Cyrus. Thank you, SFRI, for uh, having me. Um, let me just uh, figure out these. How do I share my screen? Okay, so the, the third, the third icon we need to click on the share yeah. and then open your PowerPoint. Okay. Yep, perfect. You're ready to go. Okay, I can see it. Okay. Yep, just go to your phone. All clear? Screen. Yeah, all good. Okay, you can still hear me fine? Yes, yes, all clear. Okay, so yes. thanks again uh, for having me. Uh, again, Clark Simons uh, here uh, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, originally. And uh, I'm really happy to, to talk to you all about strength and conditioning, a passion that I've had uh, since I was in high school. Um, uh, just a little bit about me, uh, I've been in this industry for over 15 years, uh, in the US for over 10, and uh, here in India for the last, uh, between six and seven years. And um, so uh, I've been based in Delhi for the last uh, four and a half years. Uh, I do have a master's in exercise science and uh, a few credentials uh, at the bottom you can see there. So what today I wanted to talk to you um, about strength and conditioning for high performance in squash. Uh, so let me just, how can I minimize? Uh, okay, there we go. Just covering some of my slides. Uh, how can we uh, build a scientific and individualized program for physical fitness in squash? Um, as I understand it, squash has um, really, I think, in the few years that I've been here, uh, the last four and a half years has grown tremendously uh, from live, uh, you know, online matches shown and just on the world stage, they're doing uh, much better uh, over the last uh, time that I've been here. And um, so I wanted to kind of bring, you know, I think there's a lot of people that are doing perhaps what they were brought up doing or what other people have been doing. And uh, so I wanted to kind of give you some of the tools to develop your own kind of scientific and individualized program uh, for physical fitness. I'm going to be asking some questions. Um, so um, I will need to get some responses just to get, get you guys interacting. Uh, with me i'm used to doing this face to face of course as most of us are and um so really help to get uh, your feedback as i go through uh, so clark just before you start would you like yeah. people to to join in and ask questions the way i'm speaking right now or do you prefer them to just type and you want to discuss it in the end um i think type type it in um and we'll discuss at the end but there will be some essentially like poll questions that I will ask. And um, so I didn't know how that would work. Uh, if I was gonna be able to see responses in the chat to those poll questions or not. Yes, you can see responses. Okay. And that's in the top right, uh, I can see here. I yeah, can see so your face and um, 
If I go to chat, okay. Yeah, just click on chat, you'll get to see all the stuff. Gotcha. Okay, so just a kind of overview. Um, we're going to introduce to you kind of broadly uh, sports science and LTAD. Um, and uh, how you go about planning for physical fitness, uh, and then how do we build a strong foundation, and then how do we do uh, training for high performance. Uh, we're gonna basically start with a uh, big picture in the end and work back from there. So first question I have for, uh, from you is, um, how do you primarily approach, you can put A, B, or C, uh, approach training your squash players? Do you follow practices of top players, leading countries? Uh, do you customize your, you know, have a customized based uh, approach on your athlete's current abilities and goals? Or maybe perhaps the training uh, you were brought up with or whatever resembles the closest <laughs> to those. You can just put your answers in real quick. I, I would say B, customized based on athlete current ability goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can just yeah, write you it just, in because uh, okay, it'll be too much if uh, you verbalize it. I'll be able to see it as you come in. Okay. Yeah, it looks like uh, B, that's great to see that. Um, you guys do really try to customize your uh, program according to your athletes' current abilities and goals. Uh, that's going to be great because now I can, um, you know, speak from that context and not convince you that that's a <laughs> what you should be doing. So first of all, just a, a little brief about uh, scientific approach to training. Uh, what we're talking about here is a long-term athlete development. Uh, I believe you've had a uh, lecture on that uh, in the last couple of weeks. And um, I wasn't able to quite get to watching that, but I do want to watch that uh, also. But uh, these are the top concerns as we talk about a developmentally appropriate and scientific approach to high performance is that we want to have that base of just a healthy environment. This is very, it almost goes without saying, you don't want somebody with major health concerns doing certain things. Um, and if you know about those health concerns, it would not be uh, ethical for you as a coach to you know, put them to, you know, let's say an asthmatic uh, may have certain uh, you know, contraindications, things that they should not be doing. Uh, general safety, and then of course, injuries. Uh, so we want to mitigate uh, those injuries. We want to be avoiding peaking too early, which from my experience in, uh, in squash and here, that perhaps the model that, of long-term athlete development that um, typically is used for the world where people are peaking maybe at 18 to, 18 to 30 years old and really trying to go on to uh, professional careers, Olympics, and things like that. Uh, here, sometimes the goal is professional career, but uh, in a lot of ways, uh, I, what I've seen is that uh, athletes have a goal of um, getting to college and perhaps getting a scholarship. That might be one of the major goals. Um, and so if that's the case, the end goal is 18 to 20 two, then peaking too early uh, could mean that you're peaking at 12, 13, 14 years old, uh, whereas normally we would say, you know, peaking too early could be as early as that, but up to 16, 17. In other words, if you're a highly ranked um, person, uh, athlete, squash player at 13, that no college, if you, that's your goal or professional, ranks. No, that means nothing. Uh, and so we don't want them to be peaking when they're 12, 13, 14. We want to be developing them and making sure that they are getting continual pro, 
uh, improvement. And then that kind of ties in with the burnout. A lot of athletes are getting burnout early. And so obviously if we're trying to develop them for high performance in a developmentally appropriate manner, uh, we don't want them to be burning out. And then of course, longevity, uh, this speaks to a career or even, you know, even in India, there's a lot of adult, um, you know, the national championships and things like that are, you have those age categories that are uh, maybe a little bit closer to my age. Uh, <laughs> even those uh, people that want to play for the rest of their life can do that. So uh, we want them to be able to do that. Now, one of the things that uh, I wanted to do with this presentation is that I wanted to take a movement in squash, uh, something that I commonly hear from athletes and coaches, parents, and and just kind of use that as a backdrop for the whole presentation. So when we talk about something like uh, defending a drop shot in the corner and then returning back to T position, you, you, a lot of people, a lot of the kind of uh, needs that people come to us with are, I want my player to be faster on the court. I want their, uh, them to be able to come out of uh, this kind of a, a, a situation and be able to play the next shot uh, appropriately and with balance and power and uh, with strategy and tactics all in, intact, not just for survival. And so these are, these are not an exhaustive list of the uh, types of demands that are there in this kind of movement, but uh, just speaks to the complexity uh, of something as simple or as as unique to uh, taking a drop shot off the corner and then coming back to tee. These are all things that are required uh, when you think about that shot. So if somebody comes to me and says, I want to improve this, or they're very slow at this skill or this situation, I can't stop there and say it's simply a speed issue, or it's simply a balance issue or core stability issue yet, okay? You may have some theories as coaches and, and we would talk about that. So the first thing that we do as a strength and conditioning uh, trainer is to assess those demands. And so when we talk about the physical fitness parameters involved uh, in squash and in particular this movement, we can talk about reaction time. You know, somebody's going to be responding to a previous hit and they may need to react uh, quickly. Um, there is that core stability element, shoulder mobility, upper and lower body power, uh, anaerobic endurance. If they're too tired, they can't even get to it, then uh, that's an issue. Upper and lower body strength. So these are just a, some of the categories of fitness parameters that you have to kind of think through um, when you're talking about a drop shot, defending a drop shot. So, so when we talk, let's back up and kind of define strength and conditioning a little bit and what our primary purpose is. Uh, yes, it's to develop health and fitness attributes. It's to improve sports performance. It's to reduce risk of injury. These are all very common things that you can think of. Um, and we, but we also want to build a solid foundation to facilitate sports specific gains. So if we're talking about the drop shot, defending the drop shot as a sports specific uh, parameter, we need to build a solid foundation to uh, facilitate improvements there. So the first thing that we need to do is to, um, yes, we need to do a needs analysis. We need to figure out what physical attributes you guys are all familiar with that. And then what do we need to do? We need to figure out, okay, what of those parameters uh, is this person needing more of or needs to prioritize? And so um, this is a, a nice quote that if you're, you know, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. You know, in other words, if you think that, um, you know, you're, let's say you see this drop shot and defending the drop shot as a need, and you say it's 
it's got to be core stability. And um, you find out through further assessment that it's not core stability and you go through, you bark down the wrong tree, then that could be, um, you know, kind of delay the prog progress that you're going to see with your athlete. So you need to know where you're going. That leads to the, you know, the idea that we need to do assessments and, and things like that. So um, one of the things that is the missing link to high performance is that um, we, yes, we all want them to enjoy and that's what's going to kind of keep them coming back. They, they need to have a passion for playing. And sometimes that is a, a difficult thing for young athletes. Maybe the parents pressure is there. Um, maybe sometimes we tend to put too much pressure on them. And so that can kind of um, kill their enjoyment a little bit, but we want that enjoyment. We want to have consistency and we want them to do that over the long term. And some of the times the missing link is not really having a, a plan uh, to achieve that high performance. So I just want to stop here and just uh, before we talk about uh, the plan and what that entails, uh, what is the ideal time frame? Um, let's all answer the first one first. And this first one is A, two to four is A, four to six is B, six to eight is C, and eight plus is uh, D. Just answer the ideal time frame for a duration of an off season to make it effective. A is two to four, four to six is B, six to eight is C, all right, a lot of variety actually, A between A, B, and C, probably I would say mostly B and C seems, maybe more C. Um, okay, the second question I would have is, should you participate in competitions during off season? So you can say why for yes and, and for no. Again, a lot of yeses and nos. So there is a little bit of debate out there uh, among you guys as to should you participate in competitions and how long should it be four to six, six to eight weeks? Uh, what's the ideal time frame? Um, I will say there's, you know, when you ask a poll question, there's always caveats and, uh, you know, you can't have a discussion and you have to answer one. And so there is complexity to this, these answers um, that we can't always explain. But I would say generally speaking, um, if we're talking about a ideal time frame for a duration of an off season, I would say it's at least six to eight weeks long. Uh, and that one of the defining characteristics of an off season is that you are not participating in competitions. Um, So here's just a few of the rules for highly effective off, off seasons. One is that uh, it is a duration of at least six to eight weeks um, because what you're looking at with off season is making a, um, a stepwise improvement, an accelerated stepwise improvement to uh, whatever things you're working on. And so if a lot of people, a lot of uh, the athletes that we've been working with, um, they, they want to believe that competitions don't disrupt off seasons. And we all know that, uh, I'm sure that you can see that when I've had numerous cases where um, people will, or athletes will, you know, want, say a two week is a off season, 
And so one factor is they go into the competition, uh, let's say they get a nickel, they get a, a strain, um, it's a, there's travel involved, so there's days you know, before and after the tournament. Uh, perhaps um, you know, they get sick or they, something goes wrong. And so more often than not, what I found is that uh, competitions are pretty disruptive if you're going to um, identify an off-season as a period of time. You, it's practically speaking, it it becomes a, a disruption to the step, the accelerated progress that you want to make during off season. And so one of the th ways that uh, in the strength and conditioning science, we define off season is that there are no competitions. And just practically speaking, we would want you to prioritize two to three areas of greatest need. And the idea of with the time frame of six to eight weeks is that the research uh, when it comes to strength, for example, uh, the research shows that it, every six weeks of continual uh, three to four times a week of strength and conditioning or strength building will produce about 10% improvement. Um, and so if you're expecting huge gains, sometimes um, if a new athlete comes and they have no training experience, they can actually get higher gains than the average that research says. But once you get into kind of a, an area of, um, you know, of the schedule where you are coming consistently and you have a duration of six to eight weeks, the average gains that you're going to make is about 10% improvement in your strength. And so um, that seems in a way a pretty small improvement. You know, it, let's say this person that needs to defend a drop shot has low, low, uh, low, low body strength. And let's say their squats, you know, the, the minimum standard for squat measurements is one and a half times your, your body weight. And the, you know, elite level would get to two times their body weight of being able to do one, one repetition. And so, you know, if you're, many of the athletes are not even at the one or one and a half times their body weight, let alone the two times their body weight. And so 10% um, seems very small. If you're able to squat 60 kgs, that means in, t in six weeks, you can expect to, to gain or improve that by six kgs. And, um, you know, of course, there's a, a range and it depends on a lot of factors, how consistent they are you know, maturity level and things like that. So in order to get accelerated get gains, um, you know, you will need to have a good six to eight weeks to uh, achieve those things. Um, another thing about a highly effective off season is that you would get assessed. Obviously, if you've done a needs analysis, you figured out uh, some of the areas of improvement that you need to make, um, then you need to figure out, okay, uh, if it's between upper body strength, core strength, and lower body strength, the biggest area of need is lower body strength, then the other two will get less of a priority. And uh, we have to remember our body has only a certain capacity uh, to, you know, getting gains. And so um, typically what happens is when an athlete is in the in-season, they're strength levels actually either stay the same or they decrease, especially with a long season um, that squash has, you know, the uh, strength gains and the individual physical parameters that we talk about with power and things like that, they will typically uh, go down or maybe stay the same. And that's the idea of an in-season training program. You have to maintain those things, but oftentimes the training volume is so high uh, that we wouldn't expect somebody to improve their vertical jump in season, or we wouldn't uh, expect them to improve on their bench press or things like that. Of course, there's a whole lot of uh, parameters. If they are beginner again, they could get improvements uh, throughout the year and it could be kind of very steady. What we're working on with off season is getting a jump up and then, um, you know, trying to maintain those until the next 
off season, then make a bigger jump and then, um, you know, start to try to maintain. So, um, so these are just, uh, this is not an exhaustive list of uh, how we're having a highly effective off season, but just some things to think about um, that we need to prioritize it and uh, we need to make it more sci more in line with the scientific literature out there. Um, all right, so some this is kind of a, a busy slide, um, but you can see that the duration of residual training effects for different motor abilities um, are different depending on what your goal is. So let's say if you want to build maximal strength, you would need to, you know, the residual training effects of the uh, training stimulus that you're doing stays for around uh, five days, give or take three. So let's say two days minimum, maximum eight days. Um, so that means if you're in the in-season time, you would need to have a maximal speed day at least once, maybe twice a week to maintain their speed levels. And uh, one of the things that uh, we talk about when we, we talk about strength, I mean, when we talk about speed, is that speed, you cannot be fast if you are fatigued, okay? So you have a difference between, um, you can have the same drill, let's say a sprinting exercise, and one of them you get full recovery, and you're able to produce uh, a 10 meter sprint, let's say, at maximal speed of what your potential is at that moment. If you get full recovery, each sprint enables you to go to your maximum speed. Because there's a principle called um, specificity in strength and conditioning and in the physical world, if we uh, want to build speed, we cannot build speed if we're going at 80%. It just, it, philosophically and scientifically, it doesn't uh, make sense. So um, if you're doing repeat sprints, you have to give yourself enough recovery to have that person be able to reach their potential for that day, okay? So um, that's just something we see a lot is uh, we kind of throw around these terms of speed and strength and uh, they're not always accurate. You know, if we're having a speed day and you do repeat sprints, um, you know, with very inadequate rest, it becomes a, an anaerobic endurance day or an aerobic endurance day. It no longer meets the requirements to be a speed day. So it's very important. Our body has a specific adaptation to whatever demand you give it. And, um, uh, so you have to be careful on how you to how you do your speed days, but this is just an example. Every you know, if you're in season, you want to maintain your your athlete's speed. You have to have a speed day that's specific to maximal speed. Um, you know, once or twice a week. Let's take maximum strength. So your maximum strength has a re residual training effect of thirty. Uh, days give or take five okay so that means you could potentially maintain your maximum strength if you did a maximum strength type of a workout once a month okay that might be mind-blowing to you that's to maintain now to improve you need to do it two to three times a week maybe four times a week i mean the research is really i would say centered around three to four times a week that you would need to uh be training to build um maximum strength um that doesn't mean the same body part you know four times a week obviously but uh you do need to the the needs that you have to gain are different than um uh the needs that you have to maintain so Again, with max strength, one of the things we see is, okay, I'm going to have a strength day, and it's um, three sets of 15 reps of push-ups. And 
the person isn't fatigued at the end of 15 um, and they're able to do, and we do it in a circuit format and we're going to do a strength day. Yep. We're going to do, put you, put this into a circuit. Really what you're building is strength endurance. When we're talking about 15 reps, 12 reps, um, and putting it into a circuit and things like that, that's really a strength endurance day. And what you're building is repeated amounts of reps that that person can do, but you're not building strength. Building max strength requires one to six reps at a high, very high weight, because what we're doing is trying to increase the force production. So, <clears throat> yeah, I won't linger on that, but just to, to let you know that there are, uh, you know, there's a, an amount of time that you need to, to have devoted to these different parameters. And, um, you know, you need to take that into consideration when we talk about off season planning and in season. All right, so this is a <clears throat> next question here. What gives you the best bang for your buck to improve agility in experienced squash players? A, B, C, D, E, or E. What gives the best bang for your buck? Means if you have the smallest amount of time devoted to improving agility, what type of thing should you be, what has the best gains or output from the, the input that you give it? In other words, uh, if you have, let's make this more real, this drop shot defense that you have, if you are, um, if somebody's having trouble with it, what do you do more of? Do you do more sports specific court movement drills with them and just drill it into them? Or do you do, um, you know, more ladder drills or more shuttle runs? Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, variety here, <laughs> as you can see. Um, <clears throat> from a sports science standpoint, um, what we have to look at with respect to, um, uh, there's a lot of answers, A, D, and E, you know, that? <laughs> that's leaving very little to, the question, but um, we have to think through um, <clears throat> the area of expertise that somebody has. Okay, so um, if you come to me and you say, All right, what my athlete is very slow on the court, and I want you to work, start working with them, that, that would be maybe a different answer to this then if you are asked this and said, all right, your athlete has trouble with speed on the court, which one are you going to focus on as a coach? So I would say that for a coach to answer this, <clears throat> the answer would be um, more closer to sport specific court movement drills because that is the, um, that's really your specialty. Um, you know, when you think about it, you're, the, you're an expert in the drills, the skills, the tactics, strategies that um, an athlete needs to have to be a better squash player. Um, shuttle runs have an influence, of course, because uh, if they're tired, they're going to be, their agility is going to be down. Okay. Uh, ladder drills are pretty ineffective for. I would say agility in the true sense. Now, they do help with some footwork, which can improve agility, but I would say this does not have the biggest bang for the buck. Um, I wouldn't expect the coach to do the strength and power work um, because strength and power is a whole different ball game. Like I said in the last slide, you know, if you're not training them 
in a very specific way, they're only going to adapt to the demand that you give it. And if you give them the, the wrong demand, thinking that you're giving them the right demand, you might end up somewhere else, like that quote says. So if I was asked this, I would say, I'm not gonna do, you know, 80% sports specific court movement drills in my training session with my athlete, because presumably they're already training and doing a lot of those court movement drills with the coach. What I would do, what the biggest bang for my buck would be is to work on strength and power and perhaps shuttle runs if the coach is not working on that. So, um, so it is a little bit of a, a complicated answer, but uh, I would say that from, from my standpoint, strength and power would by far be one of the best out of these, uh, presuming that you are getting court movement drills on the court already, it doesn't make any sense for me as a non-squash coach to then give you, uh, as a majority of my time given to that athlete, uh, more court movement drills. My job is really, and my specialty is strength and conditioning, strength and power, so. All right, so squash needs, you can see here, it needs speed, right? Speed is the, you know, if you're trying to defend that drop shot, you have got to be fast getting there and you've got to be fast coming back, but with control and your mindset has to be right. You have to have the energy to do that. Okay, so we need the correct amount of force. We need properly timed force production. Okay, so the correct amount means that you have to, um, when you lunge to get to that ball, if you push yourself too forcefully for what your balance allows or your hip stability or your core stability allows, you're going to push yourself so forcefully. Let's say your, power, your lower body strength is so, you know, so good. You push yourself, but you don't have those other prerequisites of core stability and balance. You're going to go off balance. Okay. So you need to have the correct amount of force. It's almost like playing within your strengths. Um, this, this means properly timed force production is uh, really about um, when you should be pushing off. And then correct delivery and direction of the forces. Obviously, if you're trying to get back to the T or the center of the court or, or slightly to the side, you know, you have to be aware of where the player is and avoid, you know, running into them. You have to have the uh, correct delivery and direction of the forces um, to, to do it right. And then you have to overcome reactive forces. And so uh, what you have to do is you're stepping in and you have to overcome that stepping and that momentum you're creating to step back to the T. And then um, repeated force production continuum, basically you have to repeat that many, many times, okay? So you can see here the force, 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 correct amount, properly timed. All of this refers to something that is a precursor to, and really gives you the best bang for your buck to building speed. So here's just another um, you know, graphic to show all of these factors are needed, uh, moving often and moving well. Okay, so this is something I'm going to talk about later on, but if you don't move well and you move often first, likelihood is that you're going to get injured, you're going to be less efficient in your movement patterns, and, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So really, speed needs strength. Strength is maximizing the force that you're pushing with. In this case, pushing off the ground. Um, so power is king, speed is king, but strength is a precursor to that. And so I want to talk to you about how to systematically build speed. And that's what I talked about. We're starting with the, the end, which is the speed of a movement, and we're working back now. So I'm gonna to try to make things as simple as possible, but no simpler. Um, <clears throat> so basically what is functional movement? Uh, so if we want to have um, speed and power, 
and we want to develop strength that will build that speed and power, we need to be able to even get into that position. So you, I'm sure you've many times seen athletes and they don't have good uh, hip mobility to get into that lunge position. We could have them lunge all day long, but if they don't have that prerequisite of hip mobility, they're going to be strapped and they're going to decrease their potential um, for gains in power and, and speed. So we have to, there, there is a systematic way to look at this. And the, the basic thing that you can kind of narrow it down to is making sure that they have adequate or a minimum competency of ability to move. That's what functional movement is. And so what prevents proper movement? We can see that, yes, flexibility, lack of flexibility, you could say, tightness, uh, weakness. These are all areas of uh, movement that prevent proper movement. But there's so much more to it. There's so much more. There's stability. There's flexibility. There's pain. <clears throat> How do we go back? OK. <laughs> um, There's mobility, there's asymmetries, there's, there's tightness and all these things. So if we're going to increase the speed on the court, we cannot simply say, all right, we need to increase power. Well, everybody knows that. The point is, how do we break it down into smaller bits so that we can understand where, what we can prioritize in the next three months or next week or uh, the next year so that they are improving in a phase-wise manner and really trying to uh, improve getting the most bang for their buck. And um, so these are very common words. I mean, I'll try to kind of distinguish some of these. Some of you talk about flexibility and mobility uh, e equally. And really mobility is a combination of stability and flexibility, okay? Your joint has to be free to move but the joint also has to be able to stabilize in that new range of motion that you're doing. So you can see that, you know, some people don't have the flexibility and stability. Um, let's say if they're doing a lunge and you have them go down and they're wobbling side to side and um, they can't stabilize, that's the aspect of stability. But then as their muscles, as their knee goes lower and touches the floor, they, they may not even be able to get to that point, which would be a flexibility issue. Um, but if they are able to get down, but they're still wobbly and shaky, that's a stability issue. So those two combined really equal mobility, flexibility and stability. Okay, feelings of tightness can cause pain. Um, tightness is really just a tightness in the muscle. Uh, that could be because they've uh, trained, had a training session that was difficult, or it could mean that they have some, um, you know, knots in their muscles and things like that. Obviously, pain is going to disrupt function. Uh, asymmetries, you know, if your left leg and your right leg have different function, uh, you're going to uh, have asymmetries and not be able to function adequately. So what you need to do when we talk about functional movement is we have to have a systematic way to figure out, all right, what is it? Is it an asymmetry? Is it ankle mobility? Is it hip mobility? And so as a strength and conditioning trainer, these are, you know, kind of the specialties that we have along with physios. Um, and there's kind of a blend here um, and a communication that you have to have with physios perhaps, but, What is this thing here? Dita just requesting to annotate the shared content. Can anybody help me with this? Approve or decline? No, just decline. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we have to kind of, again, start with that speed. Okay, what's the components of speed? All right, strength and speed of movement, or velocity. All right, how do we assess whether they have the strength and they have the velocity able to do a, a certain movement. Well, maybe they can't even do the movement. So then we say, all right, 
what are the, the ways that we can break down this movement and really isolate the areas that might be um, areas of need. And so we talk about a drop shot, you know, defending a drop shot. Yes, we want to get a big picture with the overhead squat, but we also need to kind of figure out, is there any uh, mobility issues in the shoulder? Or is there any mobility issues? ASLR is an active straight leg raise. And what that is, is basically lying on your back and you raise your leg up. Um, that's not only measuring your hamstring extensibility, but it's also measuring your hip flexion activation, your quads and your psoas. So that stability component is there. You, you can also see whether there's an asymmetry, um, having an inline lunge. Okay, so just have them in a standardized way do an inline lunge, which means one foot in front of the other, not apart, but in front of the other. So you're looking for asymmetries, hip mobility, ankle mobility, balance, and stability there. So these are all kind of ways, this is the process that you can go through to figure out what is their limitation. It's, is it core stability? Is it uh, a mobility issue? And things like that. So then that comes to this kind of summarizes, you know, at the top, we have the power and speed, uh, which is uh, king, really. Um, but what we want to do is um, oftentimes we work on a high risk, high reward uh, philosophy. Okay. You're in business and you put a lot of money in, there's a high risk in that, but maybe you're putting in money for a business that could have a high reward as well. In the strength and conditioning field, um, what happens is if you do a high risk and you have the, if you have a high risk and a high reward approach, you oftentimes miss out on the building blocks of developing uh, performance and power. So if we look at this, it's, you know, yes, it's all about power and speed and explosiveness. Um, but you do need to have max strength, hypertrophy, and strength endurance abilities um, as a building block. And beyond that, under that, you have to have that uh, appropriate mobility and stability. And so we wanna look, when, when we talk about functional movement, we wanna look at patterns of movement, okay? It's not just, okay, you lay on the, bat, on the ground and you have somebody else lift your leg up, okay? That would be a flexibility, hamstring flexibility, screen but what we want to do is look for patterns of movement so we want to force them to lift it so that you have that stability component and um you know if they have appropriate hip mobility there then that is not something that we would target a lot of people just assume okay you know i feel tightness in my hamstring that means my hamstring is is inflexible and so um we need to test these kinds of things with um, assessments that, that assess what we are actually looking for. And uh, so how we perform these things are important. We wanna have the optimal stability at the right places with the optimal mobility at the right places. So our bodies kind of tend to work in a joint by joint um, uh, way. And so your ankles, if you think about it, your ankles are made, they can turn, they can rotate a little bit, they have, they're made for more mobility. The knees are just a kind of more or less a hinge this way. So they're made for more stability. Then the next joint up is your hip. That would be made for mobility. Your lower back is made for stability. Your, um, you know, your thoracic spine, your mid back is made for mobility and your shoulder, uh, sorry, your, uh, Scapulothoracic joint is made for stability. Your shoulder, obviously, made for mobility. Okay, so you can see when you take a systematic approach and kind of really narrow down uh, what areas of need there are, it could be, I mean, I could have the wrong idea. I could be barking up the wrong tree if I just look at their court movement. I guess that's one of the takeaways here is, you know, you don't want to just assume certain things are wrong with a person before really evaluating, um, you know, the different components to that uh, skill. So we don't want a higher risk and a less reward. 
because what we're looking for with this uh, previous slide is we want to have maximum output for every input that we give. And so what we're doing is by going from bottom to top, we're, we're making that foundation so much larger and that potential so much larger for the athlete. And so they're going to be able to develop those physical qualities of max strength and speed at a much more efficient rate and have a greater capacity unleashed if they have a good foundation, okay? So what I like to think of a functional movement as is like a, somebody that goes into a library that doesn't know how to read, they could be introduced to a library, but if they don't know how to read and nobody's taught it to them, they're gonna, those books are, are useless to them. And so if we put somebody in a court specific movement and we have not got the, we haven't taught them how to read, we haven't taught them that basic functional movement, then putting them in that court movement is gonna be a very uh, frustrating process. And so, um, yeah, so we wanna, we want the maximum output for the input that we're giving. And so that's one point. And the second is, we want to be safe, okay? Sometimes if somebody has horrible movement patterns and we put them into a game-like situation, everybody's cringing. <laughs> everybody's like, they don't want that person to move fast because that person will crumble. I think everybody has probably seen somebody on the court, maybe a 10 or 12-year-old perhaps, but you, know, you look at them moving, you're afraid for them to move. And so, um, we want to make sure that we're getting the maximum output and increasing their capacity to be able to read the situation of a, a court movement and get progress and improvement. And so one of the things that is sometimes we overlook is, is the recovery aspect. And so um, I've been reading up, there was a, a summit that I uh, attended recently and one of the things that it focused on was sleep and uh, this being a foundation to recovery pyramid, uh, recovery. And so we all know that the gains that you make in training and in your skills are not actually made in the training cell session itself. The adaptation, the improvement actually happens between training session sessions. And so if you're not optimizing your recovery all of the work that you're putting in, you could be shooting yourself in the foot, okay? You're doing a lot of activity and work and that idea that I talked about with moving well first and then moving often, if you're just moving often without moving well, uh, you're going to be shooting yourself in the foot. And so recovery, when it comes to recovery, is so vital. You know, sleep is, uh, there's so many recovery processes, muscle development and um, brain development that happens while you're sleeping. And so if you're not requiring your athletes or really encouraging your athletes to get at least eight hours of sleep a night, um, you're really doing a disservice to uh, these athletes because uh, I see so many athletes that are getting five, six, seven hours of sleep and they wonder why they're not getting improvements in, in performance. And so this is, they've done research on this, um, I mean, there's just so much more stuff coming out with regard to sleep being really that sleeping giant, I feel, of uh, improvement in sport performance. So yeah, having that foundation, obviously having time to recover, eating, you have to eat to be able to recover, right? You have to sleep to recover. Then you have these other evidence-based interventions like managing the load, making sure the athlete is in a developmentally appropriate way, getting um, enough load that they can make improvements, but not so much load that they are getting injured and sick and uh, overtrained. You have to have, you know, not just eating, but a balanced nutrition plan. You don't want to just sleep, but you want to optimize your sleep. Maybe athletes that have trouble going to sleep, you know, developing strategies on how to do that, um, active recovery methods, mindfulness, uh, and then you have adjunct interventions. If you turn this upside down and you said, all right, guys, we're going to train really hard and all, I don't want you to get any sleep tomorrow. 
maybe in three hours, we're going to do another training session. All I want you to do is massage and cold and bite. You know, it would be kind of a silly thing for us to, to recommend, to emphasize as our foundation, the adjunct interventions. And so with regard to recovery and for performance, we need to make sure that we have this pyramid right side up. Okay, so putting it all together, um, basically we have a needs analysis. You know, the, uh, we wanna have an assessment done, we wanna set goals, okay? So with regard to the specific movement, uh, lunging forward is necessary, uh, balance, stability, coordination, tactics, strategies, all of these things are, are a need for this movement. Then you come to, you know, the coach and the strength and conditioning trainer are, you know, uh, working on their specialty. And so I wouldn't be working on the tactics and strategies with them um, just like that, that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily be the expert in building the strength and, you know, the power and things like that. So, um, so we have to have a needs analysis. We have to break those complex movements down into smaller parts uh, and athletic attributes. Uh, we have to have a system to be able to do that so that we don't miss anything that could be a very important thing. Uh, we have to identify those areas of improvement and then we have to do uh, the planning that's involved in saying, all right, in the next three months, this is the schedule that we need to make and this is what we want you to improve. Um, so we need to plan a progressive systematic path. We have to integrate correctives. You know, that lends, that goes to the, the functional movement part of things. Um, that can be done side by side and may need to be maintained for the rest of their career. Um, but, you know, there's lots of different options for correctives, even with the, for the same joint. So you can make it interesting over time. Um, and I would, I would, I prefer to, change the correctives every you know, month or two. Um, we also wanna avoid simplistic answers to complex problems. You, know, you probably all heard people, oh, my hamstrings are tight. That's the key, that's, the, that's what's preventing me from lunging. Well, <laughs> there's a whole lot more that goes into lunging than just hamstring. Um, and even a feeling of tightness does not mean a lack of flexibility, okay? When you pull your leg up, everybody's going to feel a tightness in their hamstring. The question is, did they get far enough up before they felt that tightness? Um, and I hear this a lot, you know, he just needs to improve his speed on the court. All right. I want you to train him. Well, we have to break it down, you know, into smaller uh, components. So when you want to have a minimum competency, that means, the movement has to be well, has to be the minimum standard. Now, there's a lot of athletes that have that minimum standard, and they can jump right to the next stage of the uh, pyramid. But if we don't assess that, then we're, we're missing the boat on teaching that person how to read, how to move is the first step. Okay, so just kind of a quick uh, case study for high performance. Uh, Let's say you have, you're too slow defending a drop shot, needs analysis, all right? We need to be able to decelerate, we need to be able to lunge, we need to be accurate with the shot, we need to change direction and return to the tee. I mean, I'm oversimplifying it a little bit uh, because of time, but um, <clears throat> you need to assess what's involved, then you need to assess what the physical attributes are, okay? They need unilateral lower body strength, they need uh, unilateral upper body strength and function. Uh, they need core strength and power, agility. Um, then the next step is to, okay, we know that these are components, but what do we need to prioritize and what needs improvement? So the next line of thinking is, okay, we need to do a battery of assessments, figure out what are the loopholes in this uh, athlete's um, you know, profile. So core endurance, and Let's say, so these are, this could be an example of uh, some of the deficits that they might have. Uh, there, let's say we do the assessments, we find out their core endurance and power have huge deficits. <laughs> core endurance and core power, I mean, um, lower body strength is average, 
uh, let's say they have one times their body weight, or let's say 1.25, uh, a little bit below average for their lower body strength. Their hip mobility is poor. Uh, anaerobic fitness is above average. Upper body strength is poor. Lower body power is good. Balance is poor, okay? So then how do you make sense of that? How do you prioritize it? Well, it, some of it depends on you know, the age of the athlete and um, the maturity level and uh, the time that they can give to uh, you know, the improvements. But if I were to prioritize it, you know, if we're looking at that guideline of having that foundation, that ability to read movement as a foundation, uh, we have got to target the hip mobility if that's poor. Um, we have got to get that foundation of core endurance um, if that's poor. If balance is poor, that's a very foundational uh, element. We have to isolate that out and see, is that, the, is that really the case? Um, if their lower body strength is average, I would say as far as a bang for the buck in a, defending a drop shot, I think lower body strength is of utmost importance. So I would put that probably as the next thing. Even though their anaerobic fitness is above average, they can continue to work on that with a coach and, and otherwise. Um, their core power is poor, but I wouldn't want to work on the power before the endurance. If we go back to here, if they don't have the core endurance here, working on the power can be unsafe and ineffective. So you want to get the best bang for your buck. Uh, upper body strength is poor. Um, perhaps that, that could go above anaerobic fitness. Um, anaerobic fitness is above average. Low body power is good. So that might not, that be like, okay, it's actually not power that's the issue. Maybe we, the person has a instinctive and talented amount of power, meaning it's, they were born with it, but they have horrible hip mobility. And so that could be limiting. They probably have a even more capacity to build power, but it's being strapped by and tied down by this hip mobility. So then you've got to make a plan for the next off season, make a plan for the in season, uh, depending on when it is. And um, so I would say, you know, tips for uh, high performance, what you need to do in a broader sense is Find a strength and conditioning trainer who's qualified that understands these concepts of um, progressions and specific adaptations to impose demands and um, knowing, you know, how the body works doesn't most of the time somebody that has only a bodybuilding uh, background will, will not be the most qualified for this kind of thing because we're not looking to look good. We're looking to perform good. Um, so those two things, uh, oftentimes there's a divergence in those two, um, histories and those abilities. You want to integrate regular assessments into your program if you're not already. Um, and you want to, uh, enlist the help of other sports science experts. You know, I think that probably what all of you grew up with is that the coach had to be the jack of all trades. They had to know everything about everything, psychology, uh, strength and conditioning, strategy, you name it. But I'm sure many of you have felt the pull of not being really an expert in all of those things. And so there is that tension, you know, feeling like you want to give them something that's helpful, but at the same time, not feeling really totally confident in your ability to give that information. And so this is where in today's day and age, you've got to, you have up and coming, um, you know, in India, there's a lot more strength and conditioning experts. There's a lot more sports science help out there um, that you can have. And you know, you might be thinking, or you might uh, be talking to another coach or a parent, and they might be like, well, you know, that's just the trend nowadays. That's just, that's just the way it goes. I want to encourage you to be a trendsetter, not a trend follower. Um, you, you have got to be the leaders 
and the headquarters to building a more scientific and high performance approach uh, to squash. So you guys are really the missing, the missing link, you could say, or uh, the key that unlocks uh, everything, um, good or bad, you know, whether you like it or not. So, <clears throat> and then the last encouragement I would have is to put the athlete first in all you do. Even if parents are not putting their athlete, their child first, sometimes, maybe that it seems like that, um, you've got to prioritize and uh, put your athlete first in all that you do. That, that goes to how to approach injuries. That goes to, <clears throat> you know, creating a balanced uh, life, you know, um, with school and sports and other hobbies, you know, developing other things for enjoyment. So um, these are just a few things that I would, I would leave with you to kind of tomorrow really assess your squash program and say, have I, do I have a strength and conditioning trainer that I feel really confident in? Do I feel like they are in line with not necessarily my philosophy, but they know what they're doing. They know more than me. <laughs> if you know more than your strength and conditioning trainer, that's a, that could be a problem. Uh, are you integrating these regular assessments? Um, how do you figure out how to improve somebody that has a problem with speed on the court? What is the process that you go through? Be a trendsetter, not a trend follower. Put that athlete first in all that you do. Thanks for uh, having me, and uh, I'd be willing to answer questions. Strength and conditioning is a huge topic. Um, there's so many, uh, things that we could have covered. And, you know, one of the other things that I think is so vital, this is kind of like an introduction, but speed and agility, how do you actually go about doing that is a time for another, a whole different lecture. But I think that's a really important, uh, piece to, uh, squash. So Cyrus, how, how would you like us to do this? Am I just going to look through or do you have a collection of the questions already? Cyrus there? I can, let's see, look through the questions. So I guess the first one is, um, don't you think that a squash coach or sports coach is nothing without a physical trainer and a nutritionist? <laughs> um, I don't know if this is a, a coach or a strength and conditioning trainer that's asking this. <laughs> um, I mean, if you ask any strength and conditioning trainer, of course, they're going to say they're nothing without, <laughs> without me. <laughs> Um, but obviously, yes, a nutritionist and a, a physical trainer, um, somebody that's monitoring the recovery, um, a sports psychologist, these are all part of a sports science team that are vital to, uh, you know, taking a approach to your athlete that has in mind them first and, uh, has in mind that they need to you know, you want to get the most bang for your buck. And if that's the case, then you have got to, um, you know, enlist the experts from a variety of, uh, of expertises. Uh, next question. Cyrus, is it okay if I just go through this? Yes, yes, surely. Please do. Okay. Um, how, do you make a, how do you make assessment of the athlete? Uh, so personally, uh, so I usually get the coach saying, uh, I want them to be better at this or this, they need this or this. And so what I need to do is, and at Sporting Ethos, this is what we do. We approach uh, everything in a scientific way and in a systematic way. And so um, what we do is what the science 
says and what I would personally recommend. So that's all in one. I'll just get that out of the way. That's all one and the same. Um, what you have to do is you have to break down the abilities of the athlete. And the only way to do that is to do um, assessments that are uh, are accepted and have standards worldwide. Okay. So what we do is we've developed an assessment process that takes into account your lower body power, assesses your lower body power, assesses your upper body power, assesses your rotational power, assesses your upper body strength, and assesses your lower body strength, assesses your core endurance, your muscular endurance, your speed, 10 meter and five meter sprint, um, pro agility, 5105. We've done a lot of these at the uh, national camp last year. And so you go through that assessment, that's one aspect. What are the physical uh, abilities? How fast are they when you put them to a specific and standardized test? Then what you do is you take those assessments and you look at, um, you have to look at what their goals are, what the time frame is that they have, their calendar of, uh, of competitions and you know how many times a week they um, can devote to training uh, for strength and conditioning or how many times a week they can they are training for squash and you go through this systematic checklist and get a picture and meet with them and say what are your goals and what are the high the highest priorities we you came in with a set of high priorities these tests narrow those priorities yes i i'm going to take it Take it, uh, I've not seen your, your athlete um, on the court, so I'm gonna take what you're saying as law, and I'm gonna say, all right, what aspect of quickness on the court is actually lacking? That, produce, that could be producing as a, as a building block to building speed. And so then we kind of prioritize in a safe and effective manner what those, you know, what the next step is um, along with what the goals they have are and kind of meshing, blending uh, what their goals are with, um, you know, the, the assessments that we give and the feedback that they have. So that's kind of, that goes through a, um, a summary of how we assess the athlete because fresh off the street, we don't know anything about them. We have to take their word for it. Okay, I, you know, some of them say they feel that my hamstrings are tight. Okay, well, let's assess it and let's see if that is actually the case. Uh, okay. How can we assess the standard muscle hypertrophy for squash? Uh, <clears throat> I could interpret that two ways. One is... Uh, what are the standards for muscle hypertrophy? Um, and so what we do is uh, we, for that question, we do a body composition analysis and uh, we compare that to people that are, um, you know, of that same age and sport. And that can help us uh, evaluate whether if you're talking about muscle hypertrophy, meaning muscle amount, muscle, uh, skeletal muscle mass, um, we can see whether the, some people have a, a higher um, ability naturally, physiologically, to build muscle. And uh, their protein in their body is already uh, high at a high level, and they tend to have a higher muscle mass. So that, if that's the case, and they are not strong, we may say, well, your muscle mass is high enough. We don't need to build muscle. We don't need to go through a hypertrophy phase of uh, strength and conditioning. We may need, maybe another area is how we, what we need to focus on. Um, maybe he's asking how much muscle mass is uh, needed for squash. And that if, if that's the question, then um, you can't say the, the, 
the amount of muscle mass that is, that is needed for squash because it depends on how tall the person is, what age they are, um, and things like that. So you want to have a, a low body fat percentage and you want to have a high portion of your body be muscle mass because that's the amount of um, weight that is working for you, not against you. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered that question adequately. If, if you want another, ask it again in another way, let me know. Specific exercise for strengthening ankles. Okay, again, uh, you know, the first thing that I would say if somebody came to me and said, uh, I'd like to get a, a specific exercise for strengthening the ankles. Um, I would say to them, why do you need to strengthen the ankles? Okay, then they might say, all right, this person gets a lot of ankle sprains. Well, a lot of ankle sprains could cause lots of weakness in the ankle. Um, and so uh, specific exercises uh, without being able to demonstrate them, uh, some of them are isolated. Uh, strengthening exercises. So things like uh, sitting on the edge of a table and pulling your ankle up against a, a band. So you're using uh, resistance with the bands. You can do isolated strengthening in a lot of different uh, ankle motions. Um, if they don't have, if they have pretty good function, see if you, if you have somebody that has an ankle injury or a history of that, um, oftentimes their ankle does not work properly, uh, meaning the joint is not moving fluidly. They might have tightness in the sense that lack of flexibility of their ankle. Um, and so that might be a first or something that you do side by side with strengthening the ankle is assessing their mobility of their ankle. Um, and then, yeah, strengthening uh, calf raises, um, I'm sure everybody has heard of calf raises. So you can do that with holding a dumbbell for more resistance. You can do it single leg uh, for more difficulty. So there's ways to progress that. Um, also, you want to look at not just the strength in the sense of being able to push yourself up with the ankle using your calf muscle, but you also want to work on the stabilizer muscles around the ankle. And so in that case, you're also working on um, you know, balance and perhaps more dynamic balance if they have that basic balance. Um, that will also help to work on the proprioceptors around their ankles. Um, and uh, you know, so I would say probably two categories. One is isolated strengthening. The other is functional training or functional strengthening, which would be calf raises and, and balance work. Okay. All right, exercise for mobilizing the glutes. Okay, so exercising, exercise for mobilizing the glutes. Um, what I typically do if somebody has a mobility issue uh, is I, first of all, I try to put it into their plan systematically. And so if, if they've been tested and it's, it's shown that they do have a lack of mobility in their hips, that does put a lot of strain on their lower back and their hamstrings. So it could cause hip mo immobility or lack of mobility, could cause increase in hamstring injuries or low back injury. So you have to get those hips uh, to be mobile. Now, again, like, the, like I said, the mobility in the hips could be uh, a stability issue or, and or a flexibility issue. So I would narrow it down in that way. Uh, first, I would do some movement that requires them to um, uh, that challenges their stability and their flexibility. So that active straight leg raise that I talked about would, would be one. Um, the other, and then based on that, if they are have a lack of mobility, then I can say, all right, is it a stability issue or is it a flexibility issue? If they have adequate hamstring and hip flexion mobility, then I don't. Then I right away know that that's not the issue. It's something else that's uh, coming in the way of their performance. 
So mobilizing the glutes, I love the pigeon stretch. Uh, that works on the more of the flexibility of the hips. Um, that's where you're, I mean, it's hard to kind of explain all these exercises, but um, yeah, the pigeon stretch, I would say even uh, practicing different versions of active straight leg raises. Um, if they do have a mobility issue and it's related to stability, then I might require them to do leg lifts. And of course, in all this, the form is very important. Uh, if it's a flexibility issue, I might have them, I might take out the stability uh, aspect of it and just do passive uh, hamstring stretches for them. So, um, I love the, I love, uh, bringing the knees up and then dropping them to the side for hip mobility. Um, that also gets the mid back as well. What age will you suggest athlete to start specific strength training? Hmm. All right. This is a big one. Uh, back in the, in the U.S., back in the 60s, 70s, people thought that weightlifting stunted growth and made you slower. And so we know now, because there's tons of research out there, that neither of those are true. Um, but those are some of the big concerns that parents have and kids and, and are, is still prevalent in India. And so, um, <clears throat> first of all, you have to dispel <clears throat> these myths uh, with, the, with the parents. And uh, if you... <clears throat> so you need to, you know, kind of have your facts straight uh, with some of these things. Um, what age would you suggest athlete to start specific strength training? Uh, so if we're talking about strength training, I would say they can start with the fundamental movement patterns of strength training, which I would consider strength training, but it's not loading them with a bar. I could, you could start with them at 10 or, you know, 10 years old or so. Um, <clears throat> maybe even earlier that with the building blocks, because that's really at that age, the maturity level is much lower. And so the, the amount of attention span and the ability to kind of get their mind connected to their body is really the first step to doing any exercise. And so you have to, what I've been doing, what I do with the 10, 12 year olds is I give them a variety of ways to work on those physical qualities that give them the building blocks to functioning well. Then I would say when adolescence and puberty comes, that's when you're gonna get the biggest bang for strength training, okay? So for girls, that happens around 13, 14. Uh, they're starting to get there, 12 or 13 maybe. Um, depending on if they have that correct functional movement, uh, I would start strength training uh, with as early as 13 or so. For boys, say, um, they're, they're a little bit later typically. Uh, maybe 14, 15 is a good time to start uh, strength training. What exercises for cooling down after doing too much strengthening exercises? Um, I would say the same exercises that you cool down with at any time are appropriate for after strength training. Um, the idea is that you want your gut body to go from a, a, a state of high activity to low activity gradually. And so um, if they have mobility issues, flexibility issues, then this is a good time to work on those during their cool down strategically for them. You know, if you've identified what areas they are, have a lack of flexibility in um, static stretching is a good, is a good time to do that. Um, if they, let's say they, they're the perfect athlete. They don't have any movement uh, of problems. They uh, <clears throat> have no mobility issues, flexibility, stability is all good. Um, then I would say a simple walk for two to three minutes followed by some foam rolling would be a good cool down. 
to bring it back to resting state. <clears throat> but you can always be strategic in your cool downs and warm ups. How do we overcome reduced? How do we overcome reduced fatigue while training? <clears throat> Well, while training, you um, you want to fatigue the muscle to an extent. So, uh, but perhaps what this person is asking is, um, if you feel fatigued, how do you like coming into a training session? How do you reduce um, that? So, there's a number of questions you can ask them. Um, how much sleep did they get? How what was the quality of their sleep? Uh, how many training hours did they have in the last week? Um, do they feel stressed? How's their mood? And you can have a one a scale of one to five on all of these. And this will give you an idea of whether the fatigue might be due to high stress. Uh, it could be due to lack of sleep. It could be due to overtraining. Um, and so that's how I would identify what the fatigue is due to. Um, and how do we overcome? Well, it depends on what the answers are to those questions. If they're overtraining, then obviously rest is the, is the answer. Maybe they had a planned day of training. They need to, giving them an extra day of rest would, would be enough to, to get them back on track the next day. Maybe that uh, you need to talk to them. Maybe they're having high stress at school or whatever and a three or four minute, five minute chat with them is all they need to kind of vent to you. So um, yeah, that's how I would approach it. Just try to get an idea of what the, the fatigue and the feeling of fatigue is due to. Maybe they've been sick, you know, uh, a week ago. If they had dengue, you know, last month, they could be still having residual effects. So <laughs> how do you suggest us to track recovery? Great question. Um, so, at Sporting Ethos, what we we've we've we do a, a lot of different ways. Do it a lot of different ways. Uh, you can have them. Uh, what we find with swimmers is that they are really good at uh, kind of I don't know. It's it's in their their blood, I guess. But they a lot of them are keeping track of their training sessions, uh, how many, what the mileage is, and so in a squash, it would be maybe like. You know, what did we work on each day? Um, how did I feel after the training session? What was the level of, um, you know, uh, intensity of that training session? And keeping track of how much sleep they got. Um, there's another one is um, for one way that you can do it is resting heart rate in the morning. You want it to be under the same conditions. You can take your pulse or have them take their pulse and send it into you each morning uh, to see whether it's higher than uh, uh, their normal uh, pulse. If it's more than 20% higher, then they definitely need a rest day. If it's between 10 and 20% above their normal resting, then I would say they need a lighter day. And if it's within 10% of their lowest pulse, then um, you probably can go as long as there's not other factors that are red flags in their recovery, you can probably go as planned. Uh, somebody said conduct fitness tests. I'm not sure what that, that doesn't seem like a question. Um, you said it takes six to eight weeks off season for a 10% gain. We have roughly two off seasons in our Indian circuit. So a child starting at the age of nine would take five years for 100% improvement. How would we compete with the rest of the world at that rate? So this is, uh, you know, assuming that um, they're starting at zero, right? Let's see. Child starting at age nine would take five years for 100% improvement. Right. So, uh, yes, this could be the case. But let's say somebody comes to us. I mean, we're not doing 1RM strength tests. Um, when they're 10 or 12, but let's say they come to us at 14 or 15 and we do, uh, 
we assume that they can have the technique. I'm assuming they can have they have the technique and can perform and have some a little bit of experience. Then we might test them for their one RM strength. Say they're a 60 kg individual and they can do 40 kgs. Okay, so that's the starting point. 100% improvement would bring them to 80 kgs, which is maybe around 1.25 of their body weight. Um, what I would recommend is to accelerate that is to have a longer off season. I mean, they might be able to make small gains in season, but usually you're going down, you're reducing your levels of uh, strength training during in season because the capacity and the soreness that's, that comes from strength training is uh, such that you don't want it to impede their squash play. And so um, I would say if, if it's somebody that you've identified as having a high deficit, you may need to either build in uh, build in three off seasons, or maybe making one a ten week off season and another eight weeks. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the experience that I have with squash is that when um, the athletes do, they don't usually um, improve their strength during the in season. Uh, when we do measurable, you know, pre and, and post season testing. So, which is normal and it, and it has to happen, but they, you're going to, the other thing that drew that uh, happens is during adolescence, a child goes through a different developmental process when they're 10 or 12 as 14 or 15. So they may actually be able to make a little bit bigger gains. I've had people get like 15% improvement in six weeks, four to six weeks. Um, I mean, there's so many factors that kind of uh, influence the rate of improvement. Um, but uh, every person around the world is dealing with the statistics. So um, it's not just India. and I would say either you need to increase the off-season amounts of time, uh, or and that might mean that might mean that you make some hard decisions about you know foregoing a couple of um, you know competitions that might in the short term uh, affect your ranking, but in the long term you know if you know I have numerous athletes that come to me and this strength is their their goal. And then we hardly ever see them. And so first thing is to show up and to be consistent. Um, so that's a few thoughts. If you have any follow-up thoughts, uh, I'd love to discuss that. But that's a great question. You know, statistically, you have, you know, if somebody comes to me at 14 or 15 and they already have 70 kg squats, 100% is already over two times their body weight. Hi, about two I'm times sorry. Their body weight. It's just easier to uh, kind of talk, you know, to message you. Yeah, sure. Can I just ask a follow up question, Cyrus. It will take one section. Yep. Um, Clark, you know, sure. I'm asking you this because we are competing with a lot of kids who are from Egypt or Malaysia who are around 12, 13. 